SEPI Auditorium. So for the ones who are with us, welcome to the auditorium. For the ones who are watching online, welcome uh, in front of your computers. If you haven't followed so far uh, this Space Studies program uh, 2023 uh, that we're hosting in San Jose Campus this year in Brazil, uh, this is our fourth week of the program. And every week, it's not only we are in the campus, we're on the campus, that we have lectures and workshops with our participants, but we bring in lots of activities to the public. In the former weeks, the first week of the program, we hosted a session with the former um, NASA chief scientist, Dr. Jim Green and Mikhail Marov. The week after, in the second week of the program, it was our International Astronauts Panel. Uh, we hosted three astronauts, the Canadian astronaut Bob Terst, the American astronaut Cyan Proctor, and the Brazilian astronaut Marcos Pontes. And last week, hopefully you were with us, we were having our robotics competition. And this week, we have a very special panel that we are all here uh, to watch today. So we have two very special guests, and I will first introduce them one by one. Our first guest is uh, our very own at ISU, uh, John Connolly. John Connolly has 31 years of experience at the International Space University. So John is our uh, faculty member at ISU, and um, he did several roles, including actually being the director of this very program, the director of uh, the SSP in the previous years. So he currently serves as a lunar mission and lunar lander spacecraft expert in NASA's uh, Human Landing Systems program. And in prior uh, NASA assignments, uh, he served as the exploration chief scientist at NASA headquarters, as head of the human Mars mission planning team, lead of the human lunar surface systems team, and the deputy manager of the exploration missions and systems office at the Johnson Space Center. So previously, he also served as the deputy project manager and vehicle engineering manager for the, for the Altair Lunar Lander project. And prior to that, he served in various positions at NASA's headquarters exploration system mission directorate, including the deputy of the exploration system architecture study team, special assistant to JSC's astronaut office, and senior systems engineer in JSC's exploration office. So John is an author also, and he lectured worldwide on human exploration, especially human space exploration. As a 33-year veteran of NASA's exploration efforts, uh, John has devoted his career to creating the future systems that will return crews to the moon and then transfer them, transport them to Mars and beyond. Once again, join me welcoming John Connolly. And our second panelist today is Dr. Jonathan Clark, who is an assistant professor of neurology and space medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and teaches operational space medicine at the Center for Space Medicine. So John is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Preventive Medicine and Community Health at the University of Texas uh, Medical Branch in Galveston, in Texas, where he teaches residents in aerospace medicine. So Dr. Clark worked at NASA as a space shuttle crew surgeon on six shuttle missions and was chief of the medical operations branch and an FAA senior avi aviation medical examiner at the NASA Johnson Flight uh, Center Flight Medicine Clinic. He served 26 Ooh, years on active duty with the US Navy, where he qualified as a Naval Flight Officer, Naval Flight Surgeon, uh, Navy Diver, uh, Basic Parachutist, and the Special for Forces Military Freefall Parachutist. He was a DOD Space Shuttle Support Flight Surgeon, covering two Space Shuttle flights and flew uh, combat medical evacuation missions in Operation Desert Storm with the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, Dr. Clark is also the medical director of the Red Bull Stratos Project, 
a man's uh, stratospheric balloon freefold parachute uh, flight test program, and chief medical officer for Excalibur Almaz, an orbital commercial space company. Uh, his professional interests focus on neurological effects caused by extreme environments and crew survival in space. Once again, welcome, please, Dr. Jonathan Clark. Ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, very briefly hand over to John Connolly, who will be also moderating the session. Uh, but let me make a very quick introduction uh, to today's event. As many of you uh, know, Space Shuttle Columbia's STS-107 mission was a milestone uh, for space life sciences. But the mission's vast achievements, accomplishments, were unfortunately overshadowed by mission's tragic end. Embodied within this mission are many human stories, obviously, not only of the crew, but of the thousands of people on Earth uh, whom uh, the mission touched. So today, we have this exceptional panel uh, brings together two individuals who will share their human stories of Columbia's last mission. Of course, uh, Dr. John Clark shares the most personal connection to the mission. Uh, his spouse, uh, NASA astronaut Laurel Clark, was one of the crew members lost on the flight. And John Connolly led one of the many teams who searched 3,000 square kilometers of East Texas to recover the remains of Shuttle Columbia itself. So the human stories of Columbia uh, range from uh, the seven families of the SDS-107 crew to the mission flight's controllers, to support staff, to the 22,000 individuals who, would take, who took part in the largest search and rescue in the space flight history. The number of individuals touched by the loss of the seven crew members made the Columbia mission a truly human story. Gentlemen, the story is yours. Thank you, G2. And uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, John and I are sitting up here in chairs because we want this to be a conversation among friends, sort of like we're sitting in a living room together. And um, we have a very important story we want to tell you, and we want this to be very personal. So this is going to be from, from deep within the both of us to, uh, to all of you. So um, it's an important story, and it's hard to believe it's been 20 years already. So... Let's see if the magic of technology works. All right. So John probably knew the crew the best, uh, obviously from Laurel, but the rest of the crew as well. So I'll, I'll let you tell the story of the crew. Oh, thanks, John. Yeah, it's great to see uh, the Columbia crew back. Um, for our memories to rekindle all these wonderful thoughts. I actually uh, I knew him quite well. I worked Rick's, uh, one of Rick's uh, space shuttle missions. I did Alon Ramon's physical when he first showed up at NASA, and I knew there was something really special. Um, and I also got to know Casey and Willie and uh, Mike as well throughout my time there as a, a shuttle flight surgeon, uh, just in, we're, we, we really are a very close tight-knit family. Um, yeah, it, it does kind of, yeah, I mean, I, I won't be, I'll be honest, it, it does kind of just, you know, bring back really fond memories, but also some, some hard times. What we're gonna be talking about is something that everybody endures in life, and that's hardship and challenge and adversity. And, to be honest with you, um, you've got to find a way to turn a tragedy into triumph, and, and something that we hope we, you'll get from the, uh, the, the session here is to, to see how our journey um, ended with the things that are so much better now in commercial space. I can tell you honestly that those vehicles are a lot safer now because of lessons learned. And it's, a, it's a, a message to all of us that for, throughout our lives, whenever you're faced with a hardship, you have to think of this as an opportunity for growth. And it's something that we, if we didn't do this as a species, we would never make advances. And you think about it, 
think about what our ancestors endured and the hardships they've, they encountered. And compared to us, we have it pretty easy. And so I think the, the real message is that we're, we're all human. And sometimes to go forward, you have to look back. You have to learn from the past. And one of the things that we really have accomplished with this is a very in-depth analysis. Um, early in the program, there was a lot of reluctance to go into this in detail. Um, I'll just, I'll go through this. Uh, this is the crew. One of the things that shuttle crews generally that don't have an opportunity to is to spend a lot of time on a mission. Typically the crew are assigned maybe four to six months before a flight. They do an intense amount of training. They do a couple of week mission and they have a couple of months, maybe a month or two aftermath. This crew trained for well over three years. The uh, crew started, the, the payload uh, science crew, not the pilot and commander, uh, were picked actually before 2000. And they were already going through analysis of what kind of, how they would divide up the research package. And then very shortly afterwards, uh, Rick and, uh, and Willie got, uh, were, were assigned. And they were meant to fly quite regularly. Uh, you know, afterwards. In other words, you, you get assigned and usually within six months your, you know, your mission's done. Um, this is a picture in front of the vertical assembly building. Um, you, you get to, a chance to see the diversity. There were uh, India, uh, 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 KC Kalpnachawa was from India, born in India. Um, Alon was born in Israel. He was a fighter pilot. All the crew except for KC were military. And so they had that, uh, that kind of bond you get when you fly high-performance jet aircraft. Uh, but Casey was a very accomplished uh, acrobatic pilot, so they all shared the love of flying. Uh, here they are in their uh, uh, crew escape suits. These suits are designed to keep crew alive in the upper reaches of the atmosphere. They, uh, have, uh, they wear a backpack with uh, uh, oxygen bottles. They have a parachute system. orange so that when they land in the if they bail out in the over the ocean they're picked up because you see that uh, suit but the suits are quite unflattering um, particularly uh, they make your butt stick out because they're they're cut so that they fit for a seated position but when you're standing your butt sticks out uh, and so they aren't very flattering um, but everybody loves them because you know that's what defines them as being an astronaut here's a cool shot the shuttle is um, it's actually uh, serviced in the horizontal position like an airliner in, the, in uh, the orbital processing facilities where they do all the work on them. And then, and then they uh, take it to the vertical assembly building where the Apollo launch on uh, Saturn V and the Apollo missions were stacked. And then they uh, bring the rocket motor, the two white solid rocket motors. The big external tank is filled with liquid oxygen and hydrogen. And then the shuttle is lifted from horizontal to vertical and then, uh, and then mated to that, which they call it the stack. And the stack is actually placed on a, a, a motorized crawler, which you can barely see at the bottom there. And that is uh, what they travel to the launch pad, which is several miles uh, out towards the coast. So it's neat that they're still using hardware from the Apollo era. On uh, January um, 16th, they launched. And the, the other weird thing about shuttle flights, because I, I've worked with quite a few of them, is that they never go on time. So after three years of, of intense preparation, the crew finally gets to launch. And, and during that time, 
when you spend three years, uh, tra they traveled all over to, to different places where the science payloads were developed over in Europe, throughout the United States. They really looked, they bonded. They spent quite a bit of time in, in, uh, in Holland uh, because they loved to go there. They always seemed to go when the, the tulips were blooming and they would go for bike rides. And, and, uh, and after a while, you're kind of going, well, this is a vacation, not a, not a job. Um, but they, everywhere they went, they bonded. They also uh, uh, did an, a unique experience where, because they were basically constantly getting delayed, they said, well, let's send them to, uh, let's send them on a trip to do leadership training in Wyoming. And so they did a two-week trip hiking in high-altitude mountains, having to carry their gear. And all of a sudden, uh, that really helped bond them. And, and, and as a result of that experience, all NASA crews go through a, a National Outdoor Leadership School expeditionary tr uh, behavior training. Um, and it's been quite successful in the, in the, in the ISS program. So anyway, they, had, they launched right on time. The other thing that never happens is it's during the day and a nice time of day instead of like say two o'clock two o'clock in the morning uh so it was it was weird honestly i thought we'll never launch on time because shuttles never launch on time they can get canceled because of bad weather on the abort landing sites in europe the weather's bad in in uh, france or spain they can't launch even though the weather's fine where they are so the fact that it launched on time was just an amazing feat in, in, my, in my feeling. So it launches. It has an uneventful launch until about 73 seconds into the flight when, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit later, um, a big chunk of foam, and I say big, it's about, it was about just shy of two pounds, styrofoam. It's the kind of foam you put on uh, insulating in your, the spray on foam you put in your attic and a two, a, a two pound piece of foam popped off of that orange tank and hit the, hit the, uh, the, the left wing. We didn't know about that until you know, the aftermath of it. But I'll just go through the launch and uh, some of the other stuff. Um, oh, I love this quote. So Rick Husband was the commander. Uh, he was a very spiritual, wonderful person. Uh, he had a loving family, loving wife. Uh, he, was, he was almost like the perfect person. Great commander. Uh, it's very humbling and exciting at the same time to be able to actually go and do the kind of thing that I wanted to do and the thing that I had looked forward to for such a long time. And we'll, we'll go through a little bit of these folks' careers, but you, know, you can see that uh, you know, uh, incredible smile on his face. What I find is int interesting as a Navy guy, we never got our names put on the aircraft like the Air Force did. And so you can actually see his name uh, stenciled on the canopy uh, bow of his, uh, his T-38 uh, jet. So uh, that's, a, that's a picture of him when he was actually quite young. And his wife will tell you, from before they even got married, he had said he wanted to be an astronaut. So he knew this right off the bat. Wonderful, wonderful guy. He loved singing in church, and he had a wonderful uh, uh, voice and a great smile. There he is. Um, a lot of times when they're doing their training, they're not in their spacesuits. They only do their spacesuit training. Whenever a sim happened, and they were the, the, uh, during the simulation, they throw problems at you, and, and they just kind of knew what was going to happen, and they could, and it was it was that wonderful way that a, a, a team that's really uh, well integrated together just does things with just intuitively. It was also because Rick was such a wonderful, uh, really, really uh, strong and uh, a complete leader. 
leadership is a lot about followership. And he would also, there was nothing that he wouldn't ask of somebody that he wouldn't do himself. Here he is with some of the training folks. Uh, I think they're doing uh, probably some practice escape drills in, this, in the pool. And here, uh, even though the commander and the pilot are not assigned to do a lot of science projects, they do, they do end up having to do things during the shift on orbit. And there are uh, quite a few experiments that were done. Um, I'll talk a little bit about them. But basically, they were, uh, this was a life science payload when the rest of NASA was primarily doing space station assembly, using the space shuttle to carry up various modules and arrays to be put together. So that's another reason that, sh that the Columbia was always being delayed, is the priority was to build the space station. The other thing is the, the Columbia, which was the oldest orbiter, uh, had an airlock that was not compatible with docking to the space station. So it basically couldn't be used for anything but either a science payload or, as later uh, happened, Hubble repair missions, which would end up bumping Columbia's science mission again. So there you go, there's Rick Husband, a command pilot in the Air Force, an all-around superb guy. These are just some of the views from, that were taken from space uh, during the Columbia STS-107 mission. So now, next we'll talk about Willie McCool. You know, what kind of pilot has a name like McCool? You know? <laughs> and he really was a cool guy, but he was actually a really humble uh, guy. He loved running, and he loved uh, playing jokes and telling stories. Um, from orbit, the orbital advantage point, we observe an Earth without borders, full of peace, beauty, and, ma and magnificence. He was a real um, John Lennon fan. Uh, he loved Imagine. He loved, and, he, and a lot of the crew would pick their own wake-up songs. Every day they would have, each crew would get a, a wake-up song, and for a 16-day mission, they would basically get two wake-up songs sometime during their mission. And then they would be dedicated to the crew, and that would be uh, something that either Willie would pick out or his wife Lonnie picked out. Uh, there, he was a Naval Academy graduate, and he was a cross-country runner. Um, and he uh, also was a Navy pilot flying uh, the uh, Prowler, the EX-6B electronic warfare aircraft. Um, he w uh, Laurel called him a... Uh, and uh, what was it, something like a 24-year-old kid trapped in a 14-year-old body. I mean, he was like this super skinny guy. Uh, and he, if you didn't know how old he was, you'd swear he was a teenager. He probably got carded every time he went into a restaurant. Uh, but just a, an incredible guy. The pilot is, the, uh, is the, um, the one that sits in the right seat. And they are essentially the co-pilot. And the commander, um, traditionally in aircraft, um, sits in the, uh, in the left seat. There, there are reasons for that. Uh, they usually start the left engine first. Um, they usually make left-handed turns, so you always, the, and typically aircraft, uh, the, the, the person, com the commander, uh, or the one the pilot in command flies in the left seat. But the pilot is capable of landing the shuttle, even though, it, it say, on the, on the off chance the commander was incapacitated. Here you can see him talking to the ground. Um, this was in the 2000s, the old uh, laptops were the IBM ThinkPads. Um, lots of switches in the shuttle. It had been upgraded from a pure analog to a digital uh, system. Um, but in general, it was a, a, a vehicle that required a lot of Nowadays, everything is touch screen, uh, much easier to get along uh, and around with. Um, the, the crew would get constantly trained on what those switch throws would have to be done in an emergency situation. Uh, look at those eyes. I mean, they're just, uh, just these, these, these unbelievable pale blue eyes staring at you. Um, he liked wearing uh, shirts that were, you know, uh, outdoor designs. He and his wife loved being outside. Uh, you can see the comradeship that the two uh, pilot and commander have together in their training. It, it warms my heart to see him like that again. There was Willie, a 24-year-old in a 14-year-old's body. 
another cool view of space, uh, the sunrises and sunsets. It's, it's, it's dark, and then all of a sudden there's this piercing light uh, when the sun comes up. And they d it does this every you know, 90 minutes. There's a sunrise and sunset. Mike Anderson uh, was the uh, next highest ranking in the shuttle. Um, he was the payload commander. So he was in charge of all of the payload integration. Uh, so it, he, he probably has the toughest science job in orchestrating how these guys work together. I think it's part of man's nature to explore. The space program is in its infancy. We're just starting to get stuff off this planet and to get out there and see what's out there. You go, Mike. Um, no, I don't know why it's... I, wanna, I love showing... Look at that picture of him probably going to church when he's got all dressed up. He was also, like Rick, an extremely uh, spiritual man. Uh, both Mike and Rick were Air Force pilots, and... Uh, Mike was a very quiet guy. He loved to just absorb what was going on around him. Very competent pilot, just a wonderful person. And a really great payload commander because he really understood all the other things that were being done and how he could help that uh, go down. Um, when they do their training before launch, they get into a armored personnel carrier and drive around. And if they ever have to do a pad abort, where they have to get out of the shuttle in, in a very quick fashion, they do these slide wires and then get into these little um, armored personnel carriers. And they're steered with two little sticks that control the throttle. And what would happen is they would have to go practice driving this thing down the road. It's a track vehicle, like a tank. And sure enough, they would try to race them uh, they would try to do like fast stops and, and wheelies, and the, and so the the folks at KSC were always worried about you know them run, running off the road or hitting an alligator. There are alligators out there, um, and uh, this was one of those days where they were ac actually driving those uh, tank-like armored personnel carriers. That that smile on Mike says it all. Yeah, what a great guy. He was a lieutenant colonel um, in the Air Force. Another great view from the, from the, the heavens vantage point. Uh, Dave Brown was uh, an Air For or a Navy pilot and a flight surgeon. That's a rare thing. You don't usually get to be a pilot and a flight surgeon at the same time. Uh, but he was so good at what he did, he actually got to go through flight school and flew uh, in F-18s. I got to, he was one of my best friends actually in the Navy and then also when I was at NASA. I can't help but become a better person for what I'm getting to do and getting to see and the people that I'm getting to meet and work with. Dave and I did a lot together at NASA. We were on a mishap investigation and we would have to fly to different centers and do things. Uh, we had our own planes um, I had a Mooney and he had a Bonanza and we had a deal where whenever any of us would break down, the other guy would come pick us up and it happened like literally every month. We were picking each other up somewhere broken down. Uh, but I love flying with him. He also had a, uh, a, a, a Super Cub. Yeah, he, he was one of my best friends. Um, he was on the, uh, so Willie, Mike, and Dave were on the uh, blue ship. This was a 24-hour a day mission, and so they had to split the crew into two groups. And so uh, Willie, um, Mike, and Dave were the blue shift, um, and the other four, Rick, um, Alon, Laurel, and KC were on the, uh, on the red shift. So you'll sometimes see them wearing their different color um, he also had these piercing blue eyes and this just incredible smile. I love you, Dave. Um, KC, uh, you know, nobody ever could say Kapanachawo right, so we just, it, it, she just kind of morphed into KC. And so uh, she was a really wonderful person, too. Here's the crew after an integrated sim in mission control where they have just practiced a landing sim. And that's Leroy Kane, who was the flight director for ascent and entry. 
And you could see the track on the background where they were basically flying a uh, shuttle heading alignment circle to do a landing. And they would do a picture in mission control with the, pa the plaque and also with the mission control and the crew team. So there you can see the crew in, in that uh, photo. KC is easy to, for me to be motivated and inspired by seeing somebody who just goes out all out to do something. Casey was one of these incredible positive spirits. She and Laurel were particularly close. We would often go to each other's house and have cultural night, much like you all would do tomorrow. And uh, I remember at one of Casey's uh, parties, Laurel and, and my son Ian dressed in traditional Indian garb. And it was just the one, one of the most incredible pictures I've ever seen. Should have put it in this talk, but I, I just didn't think about it. There's Casey uh, with a, uh, looks like a, a ronk, uh, a, uh, a champ, or no, a, uh, either a Satabri or a decathlon, but she loved to do acrobatics. Uh, and she grew up in India and was just like a supercomputer and ended up uh, transferring into the U.S. where she worked at Ames Research Center, which does a lot of aer aer aeronautics work. What a great person. I love you, Casey. Um, and she was responsible for a lot of the physical uh, science experiments. Laurel and Dave were responsible for a lot of the um, life sciences, and then we had also earth science stuff like uh, uh, Alon's MedX experiment, and also combustion sciences. They had little flame balls they did in space, and those were some of the coolest pictures ever in, in, in microgravity when you light up a, a, a piece of fuel, it burns in a perfect sphere, and it, it's very, uh, it, 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 there's no waste product. It just burns completely. So it's this beautiful little blue sphere. And they would see how long these little flame balls could float around in the combustion chamber. Casey had this beautiful smile, and this, I just, uh, she was just the most uh, lovable, hugging kind of person you could imagine. I love you, Casey. Um, well, you know, Laurel was the love of my life. We met in Navy Dive School. Long story about that, but I was always trying to get her in trouble because it would take the heat off of me. And she swam better than every one of us, the, all the men. She was the only woman to complete the class. And she kicked our butts routinely. and. Uh, uh, we we uh, didn't start dating until after dive school because that would have been kind of weird, but we would go on dive trips and then finally we ended up getting married. That was a wonderful thing. I can't believe she married me. I guess she must have felt sorry for me or something. I week to back to Wisconsin where she was from uh, and do a canoe trip uh, with her granddaughter named Laurel. I love you Laurel. They called her Flora because oftentimes in, at, at NASA she would wear these vivid uh, floral outfits and traditionally NASA was kind of a stark black and white uh, drabby colors and finally people started to do that in, in uh, to you know carry on her tradition here she's doing a science experiment because it's life science and she's doing specimen she has to wear uh, gloves she would she and Dave Brown were responsible for doing a lot of blood draws on the crew I love you too Laurel um, Yvonne Ramon. Ramon In my life, I experienced a lot. To be in space, to look at Earth from space and be able to contribute to human life so much must be great. When I met him, I felt something. I thought after the mission, he would become Prime Minister of Israel. He was a wonderful person. 
Fortunately, his spirit lives on in Rona, his wife, who created the Ramon Foundation, and to this day is doing an incredible job in the Middle East with uh, STEM outreach. Um, and her, her, her tradition lives on to this day and carries on Ramon's torch as well. I love you. Look at that smile. Man, he was a very accomplished pilot. Um, he was uh, involved with the uh, raid on the Iraq Osiric reactor uh, in the 80s. And he was the last guy in the bombing run, and they thought he was going to get shot down. Um, he was revered in the Israeli Air Force. I love you two alone. They named the uh, airport at a lot after him. Um, and um, it's a pleasure. I was able to go there during its dedication. He also had this just incredible smile. He was responsible for the Mediterranean Israeli dust experiment, um, where they were doing both space and airborne asset analysis of dust clouds coming off of North Africa. He was a wonderful, wonderful person. And his, fortunately, his legacy lives on in, in the Ramon Foundation. They're the crew, they're walking out to their T-38s, um, which they fly, to, they would fly to the Cape. Um, usually, uh, Mike, Willie, Dave, and, uh, uh, and Rick would fly, and the other guys could fly in the back seat. Even though Alon was a rated pilot in the Israeli Air Force, it wasn't allowed for him to fly in the front seat, but I'm sure he flew from the back seat just fine. Here the crew doing uh, training in the uh, mock-ups where they would practice various things. I believe this was going to be an escape exercise where they would practice repelling out of the top or coming out of the side hatch. Oh, this is a great shot. This is when, during their many long periods to get to space, they did the training in uh, the Wind River in Wyoming. And uh, it was quite an experience. It turns out that Rick and Mike were not big camping and outdoor folks, um, whereas Willie loved it, Laurel and Casey loved the outdoors, and, and so did Alon and Dave. So basically, the, the, uh, there were folks there that basically were going camping for the first time. You know, it, it just going to the bathroom in the wilderness is sometimes a challenge. Um, and cooking stuff, and there was one famous uh, story I remember there that Laurel one day made this uh, brownie mix in this pan. <laughs> and uh, Alon came out and said it looked like bear scat. And it really did, but it tasted good. Sometimes you'll eat shit if it tastes good. You know? Anyway, here they are dressed up. This is their uh, official crew photo with, the, with the, uh, their uh, advanced crew escape suits and their helmet and the, and the shuttle plaque. The crew designed that uh, plaque is actually very unusual. Almost every uh, mission plaque is circular, and then it has different things in it. But this was one of the very rare cases where they actually made a, a NASA space shuttle mission patch look like a space shuttle. And there's a lot of symbology in it. The uh, inclination of, it was a low inclination orbit. Uh, so that was in the, the, the star Columba is the star of the constellation in that patch. There's a lot of symbology in that. Um, the uh, space shuttle is a workhorse used to carry big payloads like the Hubble Space Telescope or the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, during the, this period, the primary objective was to carry parts to the space station. Now, Columbia didn't have an airlock external. It was internal, and so the module they could put in it to do science was called the double uh, space hab. So prior missions that had done space had used the European Space Agency space lab, and they had refurbished this to do science. And this was the first time that the space hab, double hab, flew. All the stuff in the aft part of the payload bay are the um, life support systems, because this was a long shuttle flight, it had a, a pallet which was called the Extended Duration Orbiter Pallet. Uh, they, they, so they, just like on submarines, they hot bunk. 
You know what that means? It means you have to sleep in somebody else's sleeping quarters. So they had a blue shift and a red shift, and this is the uh, um, this is the the four person um, red shift, and uh, Casey's over there. There's Rick and Alon uh, is. Alon, Alon would have that middle one. He's out probably taking the picture. Um, but that's how they sleep. It's a little cubby hole. Casey and uh, Laurel often did the experiments together. Um, and we're kind of like, literally like two sisters. There's Mike as the payload commander. He would be on the opposite shift, so he would always be checking when everybody else is done. And this is a great shot of the crew, the blue, blue shift on the top, the red shift on the bottom. And in space, um, it's, it's hard to float like that because you're always moving around, so they, they have to wait till just the right picture, and that little thing in Rick's hand is actually the thing that triggers the camera. So we'll t turn it over. To, I'm sorry I kind of got a little choked up here, but we'll turn it over to my other John, the other John, and he'll, he'll finish up this part. Thank you, John. That was special. Um, so on January 16th, 2003, hard to believe 20 years ago, um, Columbia launched uh, for what would be the final time. And did we know at the time, but it did some damage to the left wing. So these are some images that were taken on the way up, and you could see the, the foam debris and then some analysis of where all the parts of it went to after it hit the, uh, the left wing. Um, if we could get this to play, let's see, whoops. Might need uh, you guys in the booth to press the space bar to get this to play. But this shows, uh, this is a video um, that shows the, uh, the foam coming off the bipod and uh, hitting the left, uh, the left wing, and it may not play for us. But it, was, it, was, it looked pretty bad. If, you, if it wasn't foam, you would think this is a bad thing. But, you know, it was foam. So, you know, how, how much, you know, how bad could foam be? Well, it turns out that it's accelerating. Yeah. As, it, as it left its location, it gets into the slipstream, and the shuttle's traveling pretty fast at the time. And um, by the time it hits the wing, we calculated it was going about 900 kilometers an hour. So even a two-pound block of foam going 900 kilometers an hour is going to uh, do some damage. When the uh, when the vehicle got to orbit, the crew was told that there had been a foam strike. And we've, ha we've had lots of incidents uh, with the uh, space shuttle over the years where little bits of foam would pop off the tank. And, you know, they might do a little bit of damage, but we hadn't really seen anything that was very serious. So, um, you know, they radioed up to the crew and they told them, hey, we saw a piece of foam come off, but we think it's okay and the crew just went, on, went about their business. Um, we did take some pictures from some assets that we had. This was taken from a, a camera out on Hawaii, and um, it shows um, 107 in orbit um, on January 28th, and unfortunately, because of the way the payload bay doors open, you can't see any detail of the uh, parts of the wing that were affected. And NASA made a decision that uh, everything was probably okay and we should just proceed with the mission. So from this video, from this uh, photography, it looked like everything was okay. Uh, so as John described, we had the, uh, the Space Hab double module in the back, and that's where the mission, most of the mission was spent, most of the mission timeline. And uh, it was 
a very different kind of mission, as, as he mentioned, because most of our missions at that time were going to the space station to help build it, but this one went to an entirely different orbit, and so it was unable to get to space station from the orbit that it was in. It was in an orbit that was uh, sort of uh, chosen for uh, the longevity of this particular mission. Right. So, well, there's a, there's a video here. Is there anybody in the back who might be able to toggle that and see if it plays? Okay, if not, um, I, can, I can go on and narrate it. So the, uh, the mission was um, 16 days long, and we get to February 1st, and that's, uh, that's entry day, entry and landing day. And so the, uh, the shuttle does a deorbit over the Indian Ocean, as it normally does to come back to the U.S., and um, everything looks nominal for a long time. And uh, let's see, I see somebody back there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna backtrack one, and let's see if, uh, if you toggle a space bar or something and see if that video plays. We'll give you about five seconds. <laughs> I see people running back. Um, so anyway, the, the shuttle was on its way back, and um, it's, it's coming from orbital altitude and it's falling uh, through the um, through space for most of the time until it hits the upper levels of the atmosphere and then it starts transitioning from spacecraft to, um, to, spa to uh, aircraft. And so we're tracking the vehicle as it's coming across the Pacific and crossing over into California at about, um, about where San Francisco is, a little north of San Francisco. And then you can see the vehicle tracks across Nevada uh, across New Mexico and into Texas. And this is very early morning, so what people see is this very bright, you know, star shooting through the sky, very typical for a shuttle entry. And um, people start noticing that there's little bits of debris that they could see that are maybe coming off of the shuttle. So this is a map of some of the debris uh, early in the shuttle entry uh, that, that's coming off. So you can see every one of these white dots is uh, some piece of debris that was picked up on a camera or uh, picked up by some other resource uh, as the shuttle uh, headed towards Texas. So um, it's not common for the space shuttle to shed debris on the way in. And so um, we didn't know this till later. This, this data all came through you know, um, much later when the photography came in. Uh, but uh, this was a sign that something wasn't quite right. In Mission Control Houston, um, they were monitoring the, uh, the vehicle as it came across, and you could see the map on the right has a uh, ground track on it. So that yellow line is the, uh, is the ground track of where the shuttle has been, and the little red dots in front are the uh, indicators of where the shuttle's going to be in a certain number of minutes. And uh, it appears to be tracking across the U.S. Uh, just fine. And you can see the green line is the trajectory it was going to take on its way into the Florida, into Florida and the Kennedy Space Center. And so at this point, um, it looks like the shuttle is just approaching the Dallas area in Texas. And um, this, is, this is where things were going wrong. So that uh, piece of foam that had struck the left wing um, had damaged it. And at this point in the flight, the shuttle was fighting with the atmosphere to retain control. It was, um, it ended up with a, uh, a hole in the left wing, and because of that, the shuttle was uh, trying to yaw left, and all its uh, RCS systems and control surfaces were trying to put it back uh, into flying straight. And at that point, everybody thought it was doing just fine because it was able to control itself. But as it was coming lower and lower into the atmosphere, that would be harder and harder to do. And the heating rate would be going up and up and up as well. So as it was crossing uh, over towards Dallas, uh, a news crew 
was there ready to photograph it as it went overhead. It was just early morning in Dallas, about 9 a.m. And so this is, uh, this is what a typical shuttle looks like when it comes down from space. It's a, it's a bright ball of, of flame, and, um, and it's, it's heading towards the Kennedy Space Center. And we've watched this many times. Uh, even at the Johnson Space Center, we could watch the shuttle going overhead as it's going back to Florida. And it's a, a beautiful sight to see. Unfortunately, a few minutes later, that one bright ball turned into a number of smaller pieces. And the folks in mission control at this time um, were no longer able to communicate with the, with the shuttle. And um, they had had some readings as it was coming across the United States that there were sensors saying that there's, there were things that were getting hot and, and going offline that were very off nominal. Things were starting to report in that shouldn't, shouldn't be reporting in. And, um, and it was an indication that there was a problem with the shuttle. And in particular, it was in the left wing. And so by the time uh, the shuttle got south of Dallas, Texas, um, it was unable to maintain control and uh, the aerodynamic forces uh, caused it to break up. Um, and um, that unfortunately um, began a, a, very sad, a very sad day in NASA. We call it a bad day, um, but it was a sad day too. And so there's more video uh, clips as it was coming through and you can see this is not what a shuttle's supposed to look like as it comes down. Uh, so this was what was happening in mission control at the time. And um, you can see Le Leroy Kane was our flight director. And he's, he's trying to put all these pieces together in his head, all this data that's being fed to him that, you know, we have temperatures going offline high and we have oil return temperatures that are, that are uh, wrong. And we have sensors that are just disappearing. Their, their readings are just disappearing. And... Uh, uh, sitting next to him is Charlie Hobaugh, who was communicating with the crew up until that point. And the communication um, between Rick Husband and Charlie was pretty normal up until the very end. Um, and Mission Control would report, hey, we, we see these sensors going offline and we're tracking them. And I think uh, the last thing Rick was able to say was, Roger, uh, and that was the last we heard from them. So um, there, are, there were a lot of um, military planes in the sky at the time, so we had some tracking data from them. Uh, there were television cameras turned towards the sky watching the entry. There were a lot of individuals who were just outside with their, with their cameras uh, looking at this. And uh, everything indicated that at that point the shuttle lost aerodynamic control and, um, and broke up due to aerodynamic forces. The, the, gray, uh, the gray one is an uh, infrared camera shot by an Apache helicopter out of Fort Hood. And the crew... Uh, were just doing a routine uh, training run, and they looked and saw this weird light in the sky, and they slewed their infrared camera on it and were able to track it. That data turned out to be extremely important in our mishap investigation. Um, I don't have a pointer here, but the, the bottom bright lights are the three solid, uh, the space shuttle main engines. They're very high density, have a higher ballistic coefficient, and just above that and behind it, that bright spot is the crew module that was called debris item 21. We were able to analyze the deceleration profile in it by the, this footage. Uh, what was truly amazing about it is collecting all this data and being able to very, very precisely reconstruct exactly what happened. Even by the uh, um, sparkling of the, uh, of the uh, intensities, they could tell whether the vehicle was tumbling or, or whatnot. not. 
So that's what was happening in the sky. On the ground, telephone calls were coming into emergency services that there had been a plane crash and parts of a plane were falling from the sky. Um, and there were odd pieces of, of material laying in people's yards and on highways and across a vast, a vast swath of North Texas. And suddenly it became clear to everyone that, um, that the shuttle was not going to make it home. In fact, uh, at KSC, John, you were probably part w there with the family. And the shuttle is a physics machine. It, it lands on time all the time because it's burning off energy at a very known rate. And so when they say the touchdown time was 9.05, it, it was 9.05. So as 9.05 came and went, um, all the folks who were waiting for the shuttle knew that something was very wrong. Actually, what they were hearing, when the shuttle, any, when any vehicle goes through the sound barrier, either going through it accelerating or decelerating, it creates a sonic boom. And because these, all these items are coming down separately, what people thought, it sounded like a rumbling train derailing, just massive, like intense um, rumbles. And um, we hear the shuttle when it decelerates above the Kennedy Space Center and it makes a double, uh, uh, it sounds like a double barreled shotgun, a boom boom. And it'll actually set off the car alarms with the vibration. So there was, people in West Texas were literally terrified, or East Texas were literally terrified because they were, they were hearing these massive, almost explosion-like sounds, which were the sonic booms coming in. So the NASA response, this was Saturday morning, 9 o'clock. Um, the NASA response, you know, from me and many, many others is, we've got to get into work. So, you know, something's happened, we've got to get there and see what we can do. And so we arrived there, and the first thing I did was they put me on a telephone bank of people calling into NASA reporting that they had found one object or another that had fallen from the sky. And quickly, well, we saw um, tributes like this start, um, start showing up outside our gate at our, at our sign. And um, it was clear at that point that there had been a um, there had been an accident and that the crew wasn't coming home. So at U.S. facilities worldwide, flags all went to half staff. This is a, a flag at the South Pole. So even as far as the South Pole, everyone knew what had happened and, and were paying tribute to the Columbia crew. The president went on television later that day to tell the American public what had happened. Uh, we knew very little at the time, other than, you know, the shuttle had broken up over Texas. We didn't know why. Um, we had just started picking up pieces um, with a few people that we had sent up there. Um, and um, the big question at that point was going to be what happened? Why did this, why did this shuttle that had been flying since 1981 uh, suddenly not make it home? So this is sort of where I um, get most involved in the process. I wasn't involved in the mission at all. Uh, my wife knew the crew much better than I did. Uh, but when the, uh, when the shuttle came down, um, a number of us um, were immediately volunteered to go up uh, along the path where, uh, where the debris was coming down to start um, picking up the pieces, cataloging everything we found, found, identifying what those pieces were. And almost everywhere we went, um, we'd found big pieces, little pieces. Uh, it, is though, it had been as though the, the shuttle had come apart and was snowing pieces uh, along a, a track across Texas. So there's one of the bigger pieces. You can see some tiles on the bottom attached to some of the aluminum uh, structure below. A um, few more. Um, John, you might want to say a little bit about this one. This is a really bizarre thing. This is the mid-deck accessory rack. And 
it, it, it was on the left side of the vehicle, and it was very evident in the investigation that the left side sustained less damage than the right side. Essentially, the vehicle was sliding sideways with the right side in the velocity vector and the left side in the lee of the, the plasma. That rack came down without a parachute, and those uh, containers in there had equipment, mostly electronics. There was a printer in there that still worked. There was an eye pressure monitoring device called a tonopin that's very delicate, and it was inside there, and it still worked. So here you had massive destruction, yet certain parts inside the vehicle came down without aerodynamic decelerators and landed pretty much intact. But when they opened up those uh, containers, there was cords, there was all this stuff in there that was essentially still, you could still use. It gave us a lot of pause as to why some things could survive and others didn't. There were even some science payloads, these little C. elegans worms that uh, were found that survived. And there were some things that were a little more personal. We analyzed all of the flight crew equipment and all the crew module uh, that we could to try to understand what happened to the crew. Um, in the case of uh, the crew, there were uh, at least one person that didn't have their helmet on, and there were uh, three of them that didn't have their gloves on. And they could tell because the, the way the ring shows that ring at the bottom, you could tell whether it had been mated to a suit or not. So there was actually an incredible amount of very useful information. These things were all uh, scanned for analysis. Um, some of the, the helmets actually caused damage to the people's skulls, we know that. Uh, because they're not motorcycle helmets, they're nice and tight, they, basically the head can bounce around inside. So this is the ground track um, that the remains of the shuttle uh, followed, and that's Dallas up in the upper left, and that's sort of uh, the Louisiana border with Texas uh, down in the, the right, and Houston's down at the bottom. Um, basically, we had a, a track of 550,000 acres, which is about 60, well, 65,000 square kilometers that pieces of the shuttle were found on. And so, as part of the NASA contingency, um, we, um, we mobilized the largest search um, ever carried out in the U.S. Uh, it involved 22,000 people working for 90 days, and our job was to recover as much of Columbia as we could. And so, I was lucky to be part of that. Uh, very honored to be part of it, actually. And um, what we did... Can, can you go back for a sec? Uh, there's, there's things about tragedy that you sit there and go, wow, could have been worse. North and south of that, paralleling that uh, debris path, were two jet routes that would carry aircraft into Dallas into Love and DFW. And the amazing thing is, this is a lot of debris coming out of the sky, and if it didn't cross a jet route, it, where it very likely could have taken down an aircraft with all of that stuff coming out. Little miracles, you take it where you can. So the search uh, went something like this. Um, there was usually one NASA person in every one of the groups, and we had 20 folks from the Forest Service in the U.S. with us. And we organized into lines, and that's how we searched that 65,000 square kilometers of Texas. Um, some of it was easy, most of it was uh, because it was hilly, it was muddy, it was cold. Um, everything that nature could throw at you, uh, we, we saw there. And the, the way you did it was you formed a line and you marched straight. Didn't matter what was in front of you, you went straight through that and you looked for anything you could find. And ultimately we ended up finding 85,000 pieces of the space shuttle, which represented about 40% of the total mass of the shuttle. 
So there you could see a very easy field, and uh, they, they let the uh, press uh, be part of my group so they could see what we were doing, and we were given an easy field with the press trailing us. And, um, uh, but normally, uh, it was a lot harder. Normally, you were going through, uh, <coughs> you're going through thickets, you know, where you're, there's mud up to your ankles, and there's these long needles on every tree that want to poke you in the eye and, and tear your clothes off and things like that. So that was the group, that was my group that was part of that, and we, uh, we found parts of the shuttle everywhere we looked. And then all those parts from all those teams were returned to a, a central uh, area, and they were analyzed. Uh, they were identified as to what part of the shuttle they came from, and they were eventually uh, sent to um, Kennedy Space Center. So there you can see it actually snowed on us one day uh, in February. They fed us very well, about 4,000 calories a day, because everybody was working long hours and very hard. And this is where all those pieces went. Uh, they took a hangar at the Kennedy Space Center and they outlined a shape of the shuttle. And every time they found a piece that was from the left wing, they tried to put it approximately where it came from on the left wing. Um, and so you could see they're, they're starting to uh, amass those, those pieces there. What we found from doing that search is that, uh, remember the shuttle was moving from left to right on this, uh, on this image. It appeared the left wing um, came off first and disintegrated because we found all the left wing pieces first. Uh, as as the, the shuttle went further down range, the right wing came off. As it went even further, further down range, we found the tail, the aft part of the fuselage, and then finally the forward fuselage, which is where the crew cabin was. And um, so that gave us some idea of how the, the vehicle broke up. And this is a little map of all the pieces we found. Um, so you can see that we found uh, TPS's thermal protection system. It's the tiles that cover the shuttle. So uh, we found TPS with the structure still bonded to it. We found structure without the, the tiles. And sometimes we would just find tiles. We found lots and lots of tiles, as you can see from this. Um, so then it started to become obvious what had happened that the left wing had been damaged somehow. And so we started again looking at the video from launch. And this shows the, uh, the external tank and that little, that little triangular shape there is the bipod that holds the nose of the shuttle as it's going uphill. And where, where that intersects the tank right here, that's the bipod ramp. It's a hand carved, piece of foam. It was um, put on by hand and, you know, meticulously sculpted, um, but it was foam. And the aerodynamics um, from that particular shuttle launch um, took part of that foam and, uh, and knocked it off, and that was the two-pound piece that eventually would hit the left wing. So um, we did a lot of engineering work to figure out where that might have hit. And our best estimate was uh, that once that, uh, that piece came off the wing, it would have hit uh, maybe somewhere between the seventh and eighth um, reinforced carbon-carbon um, piece that is on the leading edge of the wing. And um, there was still a lot, of, um, a lot of disbelief that a piece of foam could bring down a space shuttle. It could cause the kind of damage that could bring down the space shuttle. And I sure hope this next video coming up works. So we set up a test rig where we could fire a two pound block of foam made exactly of the shuttle, um, the shuttle foam at, uh, at the leading edge of, uh, of the shuttle wing. So we borrowed the, uh, the RCC panels from um, um, one of our, uh, from Enterprise. Enterprise, that's right. Uh, which was our test shuttle that we'd used for aerodynamic testing. 
and we set it up uh, with this uh, big, big gun that fired this, this piece at it. And I hope this works. So there's, there's the test setup, and all right, I'm going to try to go through here once, and we'll see if it goes. Nope, please go. Anyway, had this worked, you would have seen the foam come from the left and hit this panel here and glance off of it and explode into a million pieces. And that would seem about normal, except as all the dust cleared, there was a giant hole left in the in the leading edge of the shuttle here, just from a two pound piece of foam hitting it. And that became what we call the smoking gun. That, that was absolute proof that uh, that piece of foam hitting the left uh, leading edge of the shuttle caused a hole and then all of the data suddenly made sense that um, you know, all the readings we got as the shuttle was coming down through the atmosphere of high temperatures in the left wing, everything started to make sense. And so uh, we were able to uh, do some analysis where we would put a hole like that and do some computational fluid dynamics and figure out how the plasma of reentry would, um, would work its way into the uh, left wing structure. And you could see through, uh, through this picture here, and John, Um, and other places on the shuttle, and it gave us more and more clues about what was happening inside the left wing um, as it heated up, um, as it came down through the atmosphere. It was kind of weird because only the left wing was instrumented. So they, they just had it on the left wing, they didn't have it on the right side. And also, it, it wasn't a crash-worthy uh, flight data recorder. It was never intended like the black boxes on airlines. But we found it stuck in the mud, and it was in good enough shape that we were able to get all the data from it. So we were able to reconstruct this, uh, this trajectory of the last few minutes of, uh, of Columbia. Uh, we knew that, um, and, and this isn't very much time as it goes by here. Um, at some point, the, uh, the vehicle loses roll control and starts pitching nose up. And um, really only a few seconds later, the main body breaks up. And um, not too long after that, uh, you, get, um, you get a lot of the, uh, the breakup of even the, the crew cabin part of the vehicle. So all this happened very quickly within a matter of a minute or so. But there probably was some period of time here where the crew knew they were in trouble. And we actually did a very in-depth analysis. Uh, after the Columbia Accident Board, which was the first year that just said, hey, the foam uh, caused this hole in the left wing, the spacecraft survival, the Columbia survival investigation team was formed and I was on that, which is kind of weird because I was a family member. But I was also a NASA civil servant who had a lot of mishap experience and in aircraft uh, invest, mishap investigation. It was the, from the time uh, that the crew knew what was happening till um, they were un, unconscious was probably 47 seconds. So it was a period of time that they actually were doing things to try to rectify the situation as bad as it were. In the analysis, when we pieced together the cockpit uh, switch panels 
we determined unequivocally that the pilot, Willie McCool, on the right-hand side has, was restarting the auxiliary power units, which was the main item in, in, a, in loss of control uh, response um, scenario. So they were fighting, to, fighting until the very end. All right, and then as more and more pieces were collected in the field, we kept adding those to the, uh, uh, the floor of the hangar at Kennedy. And um, eventually all those pieces were curated and are now kept in the vertical assembly building in a, in a very secure space um, that, um, but they are preserved uh, for history. Uh, interestingly, when we had the Challenger accident, we buried all the, all the parts of Challenger, but for Columbia, we preserved it for posterity. Our, our survival team uh, spent two weeks in the vertical assembly building going through the, um, the crew module area, basically reconstructing the, the crew module to try to determine what we could on lessons learned. Um, there's the pieces of the, uh, of the left wing that we were able to find, the, the RCC panels that are part of the leading edge. And uh, we found everything, much of it, except for the panels that where we think um, the foam hit. So that would have been definitive had we been able to find that, but it's probably quite damaged. John, do you want to take us home? Oh, we, sp we spelled resilience wrong. My <laughs> fault. No, I I, I'm a big guy in understanding resilience and how it's powerful as a tool for us to deal with um, hardships and adversities. And f from my perspective, it's really important that we learn from things and make it better. When we, when we do mishap investigations, um, the, the fundamental thing is it's not about finding fault, it's about finding cause. And so a lot of times it's like, well, who's at fault? That's the first thing you should think of. Absolutely not. There's no fault. It wasn't like somebody deliberately did this. It's all about cause. And if you can figure out what the causes are, you can attempt to make it uh, safer in the evolution of future vehicles. So a big part of the lesson for you and I in everyday life is to, to um, learn from adver adversity and challenges and make it better for those that follow. Particularly when, oh, oh, this is a picture of Ian and Laurel. Um, actually, uh, this is a weird story, but they did a, uh, a, a little piece on Columbia before the mission that was in Scholastic News for kids. And these were photos from it. They wanted to not do it. And I said, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But to me, kids need to understand that tragedies happen and, and you can, you've got to overcome it. Uh, and so the, the piece got published and, and it was an opportunity for people to talk about bad things happen in life and you have to overcome it. And, and I think uh, I was very honored to, to uh, you know, basically help those afterwards who would come up and say, yeah, you know, Bad things happen in life, and you can't just give up and quit. You've got to pull together and, and come on and move, move forward, uh, learn from it. And that, they, these were photos from that, that session. It's kind of weird. Um, about half a year after the mishap, uh, they decided to name a point. Uh, there are many 14,000-foot mountains in uh, Colorado. There are 100 of them. Unfortunately, this... Columbia Point had our, everything been had been named that was 14,000, so this is like 13,900. But anyway, we went up to Columbia Point, the families, uh, and that's Ian, uh, and uh, they put a little plaque up there, and there's actually an engraved plaque if you ever go there. We're planning on probably going back there in the next year or so. Uh, but we took a picture of the crew, we made this, kind of like the uh, Inuits have a nook shooks, you know, and you build these things. Um, there's, I think, a, a picture of uh, our whole team. This was, many astronauts came on this, Scott Kurzinski, uh, um, with the families. I was surprised, the, the, 
the families themselves and young kids would go and make it up to 14,000 feet or close to that and not, uh, and not pass out. But it was a really wonderful day uh, to celebrate life. Um, in the aftermath of the accident, um, our teams, uh, the families would go to various countries like Israel and, and India and talk about what happened and what we learned from it, and particularly to do STEM outreach in schools where um, people still want to carry this dream of going to space or doing uh, hard, uh, dangerous things. And this was one of them that uh, they named a, la a lab in, uh, in uh, Madras, uh, for uh, KC, and it was an aeronautics lab, and she had, she was born there, and she was an aeronautical engineer, and I think the biggest legacy is how we pass this message forward: don't give up, press on. Um, this was a plaque they put a year after the accident. Actually, believe it or not, they were still finding pieces of people, so they decided rather than bury them with in their own graves, they put all of the final remains in, underneath this black. And this is in Arlington Cemetery. Uh, I like that last picture, John, because it shows that the crew were just normal people, yet they were all special but yet they were all folks like you and I. Thank you all for sitting with us tonight and listening to our stories. Um, such a big family out there. Um, John, do you want to take a few questions? Oh, absolutely. You know, I know this is, it seems kind of uh, morbid if to talk about bad things that happen, but I look at what the crew would have said is, hey, should we stop flying in space? Heck no. Learn what you can, make it safer for those that follow, but never give up your dream. All right. Uh, so anyone... Do you want to have a microphone to the question? Do you, uh, okay, okay, there we go. I got a mic going. Uh, thanks, both John's uh, heartfelt thanks for this uh, talk. It was really great. I think Columbia does leave um, a definite legacy. Uh, Casey inspired me to be an astronaut. She was from very close to my home, hometown in Karnal in Punjab, so um, that mean, means a lot. Um, I wanted to ask about the future of human space flight safety. Um, I think with the very rapid advancement that we've had with commercial human space flight safety, do you think we're doing enough, or do you think there are concerns, and how can we be more proactive to ensure safety of the future astronauts going up? That's a great question. I mean, life is risky. a lot of things, uh, but would it dissuade me from going at all? Not at all. Um, if you really want to do something, you've got to follow your dream, no matter what the cost. And I, I agree. I think space flight is safer now than it's ever been um, because we, 
you know, we now have um, many decades of experience, but it's an order of magnitude less safe than just about anything else. And um, you have to balance uh, what risks you, you're willing to take with the rewards that you're willing to gain. We can't go to Mars unless we use a rocket and spacecraft. So unless we develop teleportation. I think that would be risky. Yeah, if you watch the uh, fly, you'd know, <laughs> you'd see what that worked, how that worked out. All right, thank All you. Right. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Um, it's definitely put me in into interesting headspace. I, I can't imagine how that must have been for you, but uh, I really, really, really appreciate it. Um, I my question is kind of two part. Part one: knowing what we know now, could we have done anything to prevent this disaster? And then, from a more personal side, does the knowledge that you have now ever give you this feeling of, oh, what if only we had done this, and what does that do for you? So, it's, yeah, we've played a lot of what if games. What if we did this? What if we, you know, had the crew go outside and take a look at the, the wing to see if it was damaged? Uh, what if we used other assets to try to take pictures of it? Uh, was there any way to get them to space station? There was not. Um, so we've played all the what if games. And um, I guess in a perfect world, if we found out on the very first day that this crew was, uh, that the vehicle was damaged, uh, I think NASA would have shifted into um, their mode of turning over heaven and earth to try to save the crew. And there were ideas uh, such as sending a second shuttle up as soon as possible. So you power down the shuttle that's on orbit to make it extend its, its on-orbit lifetime as long as possible. You prepare a shuttle to go up as quickly as possible and you devise a way to get the crew from one shuttle to the other and you just abandon the, the damaged shuttle in orbit. In fact, that was the very plan uh, after Columbia, near the end of the shuttle program, you've probably seen pictures of two shuttles on the launch pad um, for missions that were not going to the space station, like a Hubble repair mission. And the idea was, if we went to Hubble and that shuttle got in trouble somehow, there was another shuttle sitting on the launch pad with a crew trained to go up and rescue the crew in that other shuttle. So yeah, we, we, we did learn from from Columbia, um, and you know, we, we just, we just, it, it was one of those things that sometimes engineers and managers do where that kind of damage was just outside our experience base. We didn't anticipate that something that bad could have happened from a foam, a foam strike. And, um, and that's unfortunate. Maybe that's the biggest lesson we we got out of this is that when we see something, you really have to dig into it to make sure it's, um, it's not a problem. I mean, um, we've done a lot of analysis on this, the, the what if scenarios. Um, for sure, uh, there were a lot of unknowns. And the other quandary you face is you're going to put another shuttle crew at risk. To do a, a rendezvous like that would have been very risky. To, the Columbia did not have a robotic arm, so it couldn't do an inspection with a camera, and it also couldn't have deployed that arm to try to hook up with another shuttle. Since then, they've actually uh, done scenarios where they would always have a shuttle arm on a shuttle, and they practiced simulating a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle transfer. So the bottom line is, those are the kinds of things you learn. For example, a safe haven on space station or a shuttle rescue mission with the, it was called STS-400 that would go up uh, and, re and recover STS-125 if they had damaged uh, like the Columbia had. So we definitely made it better for those that follow. We, uh, the reason I, I was involved in these high altitude jump programs is because there was often this uh, question of, well, could even somebody survive, you know, a transit through uh, the, the sound barrier without a spacecraft or a vehicle. 
And uh, we actually showed that you can go through, and we did it on two separate occasions in different suits. So we, c we know that a human can go through the sound barrier without a vehicle protecting. A suit itself is a pressure vessel, and it's actually like a self-contained airbag. Um, so we're, we're continuing to go through those what-if scenarios because there might be opportunity for other spacecraft to be rescued. Um, I have a, a YouTube channel and I have a, a very long talk on crew escape uh, in these kinds of settings. If you're really interested, I can give them to much more detail. A great question. Thanks for, for asking. Any others? And feel free to contact us if you do. Okay. You know where we hang out. Yeah. Oh, one more. Hi, um, Tyler Gill here. Uh, I'm from Canada. Um, I chuckled a little bit when you talked about uh, weather patterns over alternate landing sites, because one of the uh, alternate landing sites in Canada is, uh, is in Goose Bay, Newfoundland, which uh, the weather there is never good. <laughs> so um, I'm curious. What other landing or alternate landing sites exist uh, around the world that you would uh, take advantage of if, if required? Yeah, so I, I work for a commercial space rescue company and we cover the downrange abort for SpaceX for the commercial missions. You're right, the, because it's a high inclination orbit going to the space station, it basically parallels the east coast up to uh, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. Um, as it exists now for the, for the SpaceX Crew Dragon, if it has an abort that is not able to be uh, a, 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 an early abort like after first stage separation where it could divert to the east coast of the U.S., if it's a downrange abort, they will separate from the vehicle, which they can do, and it's been demonstrated, and, and if you want, I can show you some really cool videos of the tests of those. It goes downrange, and then basically it starts to fly inland, or fly towards the landmass. Why? Because it'll be easier for a recovery, a water landing recovery, if you're, if you're closer to the Canadian rescue forces that are up there. So. You're right, the sea state's scary. When we do the, uh, when we launch a SpaceX Crew Dragon and we're looking at the weather in Canada, it's, it's really high sea state, cold, uh, it won't be a good day, but we have assets that can go follow the, sh the, follow the uh, Crew Dragon and actually eject them out of the C-130s with recovery forces. If you're interested, I could show you videos of some of that stuff. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an option. It's not optimal, never will be. The weather up there is almost always going to be bad, so it's just something you have to contend with. And back in the shuttle days, we did have contingency landing sites that we had to monitor the weather at. So if the shuttle was going up and you know things didn't go right, they, they had a landing site in Spain, one in Morocco, one in uh, Africa. The least desirable landing site was the ocean for the space shuttle. Uh, Many of the aborts of the shuttle were designed to try to get you to a large airport. And in fact, many of the large airports in the world were dedicated, were, were trained as potential shuttle landing uh, runways. So if there was something really going bad uh, with the shuttle flight, Oklahoma City Airport might have gotten a call, you know, saying this is uh, Atlantis coming through 100,000 feet towards runway 18. Yeah, and if it happened to be on the other side, they have uh, one, in, you can land in Hawaii, uh, you can land in Guam, uh, it's Diego Garcia. They're, they had places that they could actually divert. If say they had to get down right away, uh, and they could land on a conventional runway, anything over eight or 10,000 feet long. Um, for the SpaceX Crew Dragon, which is what I'm most familiar with, they can land in the water, and they have survival gear, um, and, the, and as soon as they know they're coming down, they'll be you know, sending rescue forces to, to get there. Starliner is going to be a land mass landing like the Soyuz. Um, make, maybe make it a little easier, but if you went to my talk, just because you land on land doesn't mean you're safe. There was one of the aborted launches in the Russian program uh, 
that uh, essentially landed on a, a mountain, rolled down, the, and was going to roll over a cliff, and the parachute snagged a tree. So, you know, land landings aren't any safer either. And the Russians got attacked. They, they had one where they were being attacked by wolves, if yeah, I recall. Right. That's why they carry a gun. Yeah. Okay. Great questions. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Oh, one more. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I mean, uh, we could never actually experience what you experienced, but uh, you really felt... Uh, it really felt uh, like being there for for a few moments. I mean, uh, it was so vivid the way you the way you all described uh, the sky. Really amazing. My question uh, is: uh, after the Challenger, the, the, uh, the Challenger accident, uh, we studied during SSP that for it kind of felt like the whole space program was being thrown into doubt at the White House. They felt the need for some very deft. Uh, political rhetoric to continue justifying uh, the space program in general in the US. Did you feel uh, that any of that happened after Colombia? I mean, we obviously still tr going to space. Uh, the shuttle program itself lasted, what, eight more years, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But did you at any time feel like uh, the disaster was kind of uh, threatening uh, the shuttle program, the, the sp space efforts uh, of the United States? Uh, I was wondering about that. So the words that you chose uh, say a lot about how we see shuttle accidents. They're disasters. And, um, and it's the worst kind of disaster in a way because it's a government crew in a government vehicle that's funded by taxpayer dollars. If, if a plane crashes, it, it's, it's terrible. We don't call it a disaster. But for a shuttle mission, it's, it's a disaster in, in a number of ways. You know, besides losing a crew in a vehicle, um, basically everyone starts questioning whether NASA knows, you know, what they're doing and, you know, how will they recover from this. And, you know, there was some folks, you know, who would say, well, you're always one accident away from the shuttle, ac from the shuttle program being shut down. And, um, and, and that's true. You know, NASA is expected to be just about perfect. And, um, and we try to be, uh, but nobody is perfect. And um, every time we've had a, an accident with the space shuttle, it's usually meant a two or two and a half year process of introspection, redesign, and getting back you know, on our feet and flying again. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of pressure to, uh, to, fly, you know, to fly without accidents, but that's, it's not reasonable. There's, there are going to be accidents in human spaceflight. I mean, so one of the things the shuttle did not have was what we call a full envelope abort capability. During the period where the solid rocket motors were lit, there was no way, no matter what happened, for them to uh, do an abort. So what we found is we always need to have a full envelope abort capability. Capsules can do that really well with a launch escape tower or rockets that push them away from the vehicle, even downrange after staging uh, first and second stage separation. Um, actually, the shuttle in its last decade was safer by a factor of 10 compared to the early shuttle. Um, there were many of us who wanted to continue to keep flying it or turn it over to a commercial entity. But it did have that inherent fatal flaw, which is it did not have full envelope escape or full envelope uh, abort options. But the Crew Dragon has it, Starliner Soyuz has that. It, you know, they, they have a very robust escape uh, uh, tower system. And, and actually, in uh, 2018, it, it saved a crew. And these are, so these are not things that happen in the, di in the very uh, remote past, they happen even re even within the last half a decade. Space is hard. It's, <laughs> you know, you don't do this as a, you know, we do this because it's in our, our, our genes, but it's hard, and hard things sometimes have consequences. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, firstly, Dr. Clark, I'm so sorry for your loss, and also um, I'd like you 
to thank you too for this talk. Uh, my question is, um, how can I say? <laughs> I was really surprised by uh, how young they were and um, I'm sure here in the audience we have uh, many students who are, engage uh, who are starting their careers in science today, myself included, and I'd like to ask, what would you say to these young people um, with your experience and also dealing with tragedy but contrib contrib contributing to science uh, today? Well, I mean, um, thank you for your, your comments. Um, part of our species uh, mandate is to continue to discover new things about ourselves, about our universe, about our world. And, and to do that, you think about what the explorers that left, you know, Europe to go across the globe, they had, they had no idea what they were going to encounter. Uh, incredible hardships. You look at the advertisement that uh, Ernest Shackleton had for the uh, uh, mission that was to the South Pole, and it was basically like, you know, this is going to suck, the food's bad, you know, low pay, you know, basically at the end of the day, it's, you know, we're going to be doing something to discover, to help humanity. Um, you, you, I think you have to be really honest with yourself. Is this, is this something I'm ready to do for whatever reason? But many of us here have that gene of pushing the envelope, exploring, taking on uh, new uh, challenges and endeavors, understanding that there is, there is risk with that. How many of you went skydiving? You know? There you go. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I told you today what the risk of that is. You know, it's a one in 100,000 uh, jumps, fatal outcome. I mean, so we do stuff, drive a car, we do, you know, so the bottom line is, are you going to quit living because there's a possibility of it? What you do is you prepare for it. If you're going to go jumping, you know, jump with, with a, out of, out of a, a good drop zone with reputable people like you did, um, do your due diligence. There are things that you have control over, but you can also just say, you know, I don't want to do this today. You can go in a vertical wind tunnel and do practice free falls and there's virtually no risk from it. So you want to do that, that's one way to do it. I still jump and I still go in the vertical wind tunnel. And, you know, uh, I do it because I, it's something I, it's part of who I am. So be part, do it because it, for you. All right, G2. So, thanks for your questions. Absolutely. Very good. Very nice questions as well. And once again, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I think this was a really memorable event. Uh, I actually remember myself. Uh, we had a similar event uh, with both John Clark and John Connolly uh, in SSP 16 in uh, Israel uh, and some other guests there. And it was one of the panels that I've never um, uh, you know, forget uh, pretty much every sentence of it. As, as an engineer as well, you know, it, it teached a lot. And I'm sure, you know, we have lots of people here, which we call the, you know, future of the space sector sitting in this room. And I'm sure they, what they listen today will stay with them uh, forever and hopefully uh, will make a change, uh, which is currently ongoing for the future of the space flight. Once again, thank you very much. And we have two very special local gifts to you from the uh, local in Brazil. So I would like to share them with you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so this brings us to the end of uh, today's event, the uh, fourth public event of the uh, Space Studies Program 2023. Uh, actually, this will flow into a very uh, nicely flow into our next event, uh, next Wednesday on the 26th uh, of July, exactly at the same time at 8.30. We will be again in this auditorium and also whoever is watching online on the ISU YouTube channel. And we will have the uh, Vice President of uh, Lockheed Martin, um, Dr. Uh, Nelson Pedroiro, with us. And we will be actually discussing the future of space flight. So basically, it's from the past, with the learnings of the past, to the future. So please tune in and join in next week at the same time here. Take care. Stay with space. <laughs> <laughs>